Good afternoon, and welcome to the first of five conversations about climate change, hosted by the Harvard Alumni Association and co-sponsored by the members of the Harvard College Class of 1969, the Harvard Alumni for Climate and the Environment, the Harvard Club of New Hampshire, the Harvard Office of Sustainability, as well as Class Act HR 73, Harvard Club of the North Shore, and the Radcliffe Club of San Francisco. Wow. Um, that list gives you some sense of the diversity of folks who've been involved in organizing this event and who are tuning in today. Um, at last count, uh, we estimate more than 2,200 alumni and friends of the university from literally around the world, and nothing could make me prouder. Uh, two of them, Valerie Nelson and Terrence McNally, both from the class of 1969, were instrumental in imagining and leading this effort, and I want to thank them for creating a space for us to consider the role both of individuals and institutions in responding to the challenges of climate change. And here, uh, Terrence, I hope you'll forgive me. I really do want to, to um, give a special shout out to Valerie. Valerie has been a friend and colleague of mine uh, now for north of 40 years, um, and so I'm grateful that this effort really brings us back, uh, back together. Um, uh, before I was a university president, um, I spent nearly 24 years teaching environmental policy at MIT. Um, I was the Lee and Geraldine Martin Professor of Environmental Studies. I was the co-founder and, and then the director of the MIT Center for Environmental Initiatives. And I ultimately, when I became chancellor, chaired the MIT Council on the Environment, which oversees all research um, at the Institute. Um, I have been for many, many years, um, not only interested in, but you know, my scholarly career has been deeply engaged by issues of the environment and, sustainab and sustainability. Um, and now more recently by the very specific challenges posed to all of us by climate change. Over the past nine months, I've been thinking a lot about how the future, future generations will look back at this particular moment in human history. Uh, three streams of suffering uh, are all coming together, a, a global pandemic, uh, natural disasters, and systemic racism, um, all flowing together, I think creating a very powerful confluence. Image after image assaults us, um, whether or not it's an orange glow over San Francisco, um, a makeshift morgue in New York City, or um, the death of a black man on the streets of Minneapolis. These images, I think, sweep away our misgivings and reveal the urgency of the test that uh, we all face, both as individuals and as a society. They are powerful reminders of how connected, and but also how vulnerable we all are of just how fragile life is um, and how precious that life is, both individually and collectively. I think the world needs bold and decisive action, both cooperative and collective effort, now more than ever. We need it if we are to survive, if we are to persevere. Uh, our faculty, our students, our alumni and friends have long shaped the future in almost every field imaginable, and we must continue to do so. But here I think there are many reasons for us to be proud and even, dare I say, optimistic, given the capabilities that the remarkable group of students, faculty, staff, and alumni at Harvard bring to these challenges. We're expanding knowledge um, of the mechanisms that affect um, our climate, we're developing technologies to help accelerate the transition to a cleaner, greener, decarbonized future. This work is going on in many, many of the schools across the university, but also this work is going on um, in many organizations that are being led uh, or that are being contributed to by our alumni. Um, we're imagining communities and cities in which sustainability is a pervasive practice, in which we're designing it into those cities, into the buildings, into the green spaces. Um, 
we are thinking about how we develop transportation systems that will support a, a cleaner, decarbonized um, economy. We're inventing cooling systems that will help us to survive and adapt uh, the inevitability of at least some climate change that we're already experiencing. And we're preserving and restoring um, green spaces, tropical forests, and, and other activities that will help us manage the challenges um, that, we, that we face. We're also exploring uh, through our research, through our teaching, through our practice, how it is that we can shape policies and incentives that are conducive to mitigating climate risks and decarbonizing uh, the global um, economy. We're addressing the role of industry, um, the role that that industry must play in reducing the world's dependence upon carbon fuels and fossil fuels. And, and we're imagining new ways that we can accelerate the change by working collaboratively with industry to achieve the needed progress if we're going to hope to save um, this world from the lasting effects of, of climate change. At the same time, we're all trying to model what it means to be responsible individuals, um, as well as responsible institutions. And in, in here, I note that the university has made a number of important commitments. Uh, we're trying to get our, our own house in order by reducing our own dependence um, upon fossil fuels. Uh, we've made a commitment to be fossil fuel neutral uh, by 2026 and fossil fuel free uh, by 2050. The Harvard Management Company was the first endowment to embrace the principles articulated uh, by the United Nations uh, principles for responsible investment. Uh, and we've worked hard to engage other endowments in that process as well. Uh, the endowment is also among the first to pledge uh, to render our, our entire portfolio net zero with respect to greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. Uh, but we cannot rest and we must not rest. Uh, there's always more that we can do and there's more that we must do. Our goals must expand to include um, the connection and amplification of our efforts and the development of partnerships that allow us to work across boundaries, traditional boundaries, national boundaries, boundaries between industry and the academy, boundaries between individuals and institutions. Each of us has a role to play, whether we lead large organizations or whether we are just making individual choices about how we will lead our lives um, how we will consume and what we will leave to future generations. This is a time in which we need everybody to be active. We need everybody to engage. We need everybody to urge our government and our government means different things to different people on this call because we have people representing countries literally from around the world. All of our governments need to come together to address this problem. And it has an urgency that none of us can turn away from. Um, I'm really delighted that, the, that our alumni have come together um, with our faculty and with our staff to put together these five sessions. And I'm also enormously grateful to one of those members of the class of 1969, Steve Kerwood, um, who's the executive producer of NPR's Living on Earth, who is now going to carry things forward uh, in moderating our first conversation. Steve, thank you very much for taking things from here. And again, to everybody who has helped to put this program together, you have my thanks. Well, thank you, President Bacow. And I have to say that on a personal level, I was really excited when you got appointed to the corporation, um, given your record, uh, what you did over at MIT, what you didn't even mention, Tufts, what you've done in terms of sustainability in these institutions, and that, uh, you know, Harvard uh, has been around for a while, and it's not exactly a fast-changing place, but I felt really confident that you were going to bring a focus uh, to this, well, let's face it, existential uh, threat to what's going on on our planet and, and figure out a way how, uh, how to move forward. So. I'm really thrilled that you're here and uh, that you came to this session today and that you're, you are, are pushing, uh, pushing things forward 
uh, in a way that I think can make it will and is already making a tremendous difference. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words, Steve. Um, well deserved, uh, Mr. President, uh, or Larry, whichever you want to go by. Is, Larry, it's always it's, Larry. <laughs> it's great. Hey, um, so today's session, um, the only problem with today's session is we just don't have enough time for this discussion, which is why there are four more that are coming. So I urge you to take a look at what's uh, over the horizon because we're, this discussion is going to need to proceed throughout the fall. But even so, we have four just uh, totally amazing folks on this. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to turn to them. It's going to be a bit of a process here. I'm going to ask each of them first to explain how it is that they got involved in all of this without going into a discussion of the, of the actual activities or advice that they have for us. And then we will be away with the discussion. Um, you have um, a chance to, uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask, uh, please uh, use the Q&A feature on this on the Zoom app. If you're looking on YouTube, I'm afraid that uh, YouTube is not uh, binaural right now, but uh, just go over to Zoom. Uh, or if you have to, just email HAA. Um, if we don't get to your question today, surely it'll get addressed over these following sessions. So I, I want to start um, actually right away with uh, I am missing, I am missing one of my panelists here on the, on the board here. Ah, here we go, it is filled in. I wanna start with, uh, with Lori Weyburn, who runs the uh, Pacific Forest Trust. Um, just tell me, how did you get into this business of, of speaking for the trees? <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thank you, Valerie, for organizing this. And thank you, Larry, and thank you, Steve. So I'll start with that, but I got into this, um, as a child, you know, I grew up in California, and California has extraordinary forests. Um, and in particular, I grew up running around redwood forests, old growth redwood forests. And it's quite magical. You know, the light, the smell of the earth, uh, the sound, just really extraordinary. And then, um, so it was magical and kind of captured me. Um, and then I, uh, as a young woman, about 21, went to work with the United Nations Environment Program in Kenya. And I got to experience those forests and talk about magical. Um, anybody who's been in one of those sky island forests and seen those huge butterflies, um, really extraordinary. But in both cases, those magical experiences were surrounded by intense fighting controversy in the United States around the logging of old growth and in uh, Kenya uh, with the expansion of people needing land on which to grow food and have animals. Um, and so that controversy made me see that the magic was threatened, and in each case, the magic was threatened by uh, people needing to either make a living or uh, have food and shelter. And um, the work in the United Nations focused on climate change. And I put two and two together, recognizing that the loss of forests and the degradation of forests was a major cause of climate change and that I wanted to dedicate myself to fixing that root cause of CO2 emissions. Most folks don't know it, but it's the second largest source of CO2 emissions. And that we could come up with solutions that could provide people with the livelihoods that they needed by focusing on what the forests actually deliver to us simply by virtue of being. And one of those most important factors stabilizing our climate. So a number of questions that came in for this session um, kind of boil down to two. Is it too late to do anything? And what's to be done? Um, and that hopefully is going to frame more of our, dis our discussion here. But let me turn, uh, continue with the introductions now with Bruno Carvalho. How did, how did you get into this? How much time do we each have? <laughs> 30, 30, 40 minutes? No, yeah, I, I first you know, wanted to. The next three hours no, is probably, be, probably fine. Okay. I, I want I want to thank everybody first who who put this together and you know say, say hi to to all the the uh, all the folks listening to us who unfortunately we we can't see. Uh, so you sort of implied, Steve, that you didn't want us to wear the scholarly hat for for this first uh, answer. So I'll reach back 
deep into my childhood for, for this one. So I grew up in, uh, uh, or I lived for a while as a kid in the outskirts of Brasilia in Brazil, which is an area of, of tropical savannas. Um, and then spent another part of my childhood in Rio, which has some remnants of uh, uh, magical uh, uh, Atlantic rainforests too. And, and I was absolutely enamored of birds uh, uh, um, as a kid. So as I learned about deforestation, extinction in, in the news in the 80s, uh, uh, 90s, um, you know, I, I remember the profound sadness of, of imagining these creatures I loved dying off. And, and, and I think, you know, I, I don't know if I would have had the strength to devote my life as a researcher to, to uh, uh, biodiversity. Um, but looking back, I realize that these early uh, childhood experiences have in all sorts of ways uh, uh, shaped my interest in my research on, on, on cities and on how certain models of urbanization can be much more ecologically sustainable than others. So even as most of my activities remain focused on, on urbanization, you know, every time I'm in the middle of, of an Amazonian river, it, it renews my sense that uh, uh, we don't have a right to, to destroy these, these uh, ecosystems and that we ought to figure out ways of, of being in, 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 in this planet and you know, having relationships to the land that allow them to, to thrive. And it turns out, you know, even though this wasn't clear uh, as a child, that uh, given, given the interdependence of, of life on Earth, that that's actually uh, beneficial to, to us too, right? Perfect. Um, so, um, all right, Carl, I, I guess we, uh, Carol, we should probably uh, turn to you now just so you can stay awake at this, at this 3 a.m. hour for you. Um, and, uh, you know, unlike the rest of us on this situation, you're actually still an undergraduate. You're, you're really still a, a, a student. No, I'm sorry, graduate student. You're over at, you're over at THC. Big difference. All right, sorry, 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 <laughs> yes, 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 sorry. Um, I, I was thinking of the paper of yours that I read that you worked on when you were still an undergraduate. Um, but how did you get into this? Um, yeah, actually, it starts in undergrad at the college. Um, I was writing my thesis. Uh, I guess all transformative stories start there. Um, I was writing a stem cell thesis, actually, because I was a stem cell biologist at this time. Um, but I realized that what kept taking my attention away wasn't really what was happening in the lab, but what was happening outside. Um, and during this time, 2016, it was kind of a record bad El Nino. Um, it's a little concerning that that's become kind of common, right? That record bads, uh, record worse are becoming more and more common when they shouldn't. Um, but this was kind of my first taste of it. I was reading the headlines and it seemed like there was a really really dire human impact that was happening. Um, but it's one thing to read about it and to look at the literature about it or whatnot, but it's a totally different thing to actually experience it and to, to witness, to witness what's happening. Um, and so actually with a Harvard Global Health grant, um, I was able to visit Ethiopia, which was one of the worst hit um, areas at that time. Um, and I volunteered with an NGO there uh, funded by USAID, and really saw the impact that this weather event took um, and how severely it impacted the most vulnerable people. Uh, people who were already struggling with food security beforehand were just completely um, overwhelmed by these climatic forces. Um, and that kind of really made me realize that this was, I mean, stem cells are important too, if anyone's a stem cell biologist out there. Um, but I really felt like this was where I was needed. Um, indeed. Um, so, uh, and let me turn now to Sam Myers, um, who uh, has an amazing book out, by the way, it's called Planetary Health, and it really is outlining this new academic discipline uh, that I urge people to check out. Um, but, uh, Sam, I, just uh, tell me, how, how, did, how did you get here? How does, a, how does a, uh, a, a physician wind up in this situation? And you probably want to go back before that. Yeah, I guess he gets kind of confused along the way. But um, 
let's see. I mean, I, I started out wandering around in, in uh, pin oak and scrub fine, pine forests on the other side of the continent from where Lori was wandering around in her forests um, out on Cape Cod and uh, growing up around Boston. And um, as an undergrad at Harvard was uh, really, really interested in uh, environmental science in the natural world, but also really fascinated with human biology and medicine. And it was actually E.O. Wilson who really encouraged me to see if there was some way to sort of find a synthesis between those interests. And um, I've been sort of the poster child for the nonlinear career path ever since. So sort of trying to figure out how to make that synthesis. I, I went to Yale for medical school and spent a lot of time in the environmental science school uh, was out in California for residency and then midway through residency spent two years living in the Chumaloma Nature Preserve on the north side of Mount Everest in Tibet, uh, helping to field manage an integrated conservation development project. And that began really six years of working at the project level, exploring how natural resource management and environmental management is connected with uh, population issues and primary health care and how to sort of bring these things together and then ultimately um, decided that uh, what was really missing was a whole sort of academic discipline, a whole field that tried to integrate these questions of how global environmental changes are affecting human health and well-being. And came back to Harvard, did my MPH, and have been doing research ever since at that intersection of environmental change and human health. And somewhere along the way, that whole sort of field got christened Planetary Health, and I started the Planetary Health Alliance, um, which I now direct from Harvard, but we have over 240 organizations in over 40 countries, a part of it. So it's this rapidly growing um, field. And I think, you know, in that process, I really started with this climate change framing as well, and did a lot of research looking at changes in nutrition in response to climate change. But I think what I've sort of come to see is that it's not just climate change, you know, it's, it's everything change. And that the scope of the changes that we're sort of wreaking across our planet's natural systems go well beyond climate. And um, the root causes go well deeper than our energy choices. And so that's, that sort of led to this transition towards, towards this frame of planetary health. Yes, the whole planet, the whole human, uh, the whole issue of health, just have to bring it together. I have to applaud you, Sam, for the work that you're doing and, and doing this. So now let's start our discussion um, with also um, uh, a reminder to you folks who are, who are watching online um, to reach out to each of these folks if there's something that they say that uh, sparks a question or a concern on your part, or if you have something that you would like to directly tell them, uh, please do so in HAA. Um, can certainly facilitate that for you. All right, let's get going with our discussion. And um, spoiler alert, I'm a news guy, so I'm gonna go to the to the literally hot news story right now. Oh, is that the virus? Well, of course, but the fires over the, the near term right now. And uh, Lori, if you could start us. Um, uh, what about the fires that we're seeing on the West Coast right now, and for that matter, and other places on the planet? And how does this fit into uh, how we, is it too late to deal with climate disruption and, and what's to be done? I'm going to take the, the middle part of that question first. And um, it isn't too late, but our options are fewer, the time is shorter, and the need is more urgent. And I think that the fires are an extraordinary si signal to us in that regard. And it's, it's not simply in California or Oregon or Washington or in Australia. Um, it's to take what Sam was saying about the fact that this is systemic and it's many factors. Fire is a natural part of these West Coast systems, even as it is in Australia and in many parts of the world. And the most frequent ignition of fires is by people. And so when we look at fires, we need to recognize number one, they happen. They will happen, we will not be able to suppress them. And number two, it is people's behavior that is going to be the determinative factor about how we live with fire. I think the big message here is 
you know, people are stunned by the scale of California's fires, you know, over 3 million acres right now. But pre-fire suppression, on average, about 5 million acres of California burned every year. Some of those were lightning fires. Many of them were started by the people who lived here pre-European times. And even, even once there were Europeans here, a friend of mine whose uh, grandfather was a rancher up in Northern California, they'd move their cows up in the summer to graze. And as they were leaving, the phrase was, last one out, toss a match. Because they knew that burning was so important to maintaining forest health, soil health, productivity. And then we entered our era of fire suppression so that now we see the intensity of fires and even more so because we have people living in fire prone areas. Just like with floods, we have maps that show us where the fires are going to burn regularly and we still build there. So there's some systemic issues here about people's choices our policies and where we put our money, whether it's after the fact fighting fires and paying for the insurance and trying to rebuild lives, or it's before the fact in changing how we manage forests and ourselves to be able to live with fire. Uh, climate change exacerbates these fires, but it is not the cause of them. And one of these issues about, is it too late? By managing how we work with fire differently, we can impact climate change. The root of that is how we manage forests. So not looking at the symptom of fire, but looking at the system of the forests underneath it, because fires are going to be there. And just in closing on that, a key solution here, because that's the third part of your question, what can we do? That is change how we manage forests. And very simply put, we need to put the forest back in forest management. We manage forests for money. Let's be blunt. In this country, we manage forests for money. Uh, a very big timber company once said, well, people make the mistake of thinking I'm in the forest management business. I'm in the business of managing money. Uh, so if all we pay for in forests is to harvest them or to convert them to something else, then people will harvest them and convert them to something else. At the same time, we know very clearly that forests are the largest, safest, most expandable carbon sink in the world. And so what we need to do is start paying for that climate service of absorbing and storing carbon in whole system forests not in plantations, although those have a role, but in forests which store carbon in the soil, in big trees that are fire resilient, and for centuries, and in fact, thousands of years. And that's frankly true all over the world. So from a solutions point of view, let's take these symptoms that climate change is heightening and learn enough to say, okay, let's step back and go back in to learning how to manage forests for all they give us. And that will be well over a third of the solution in climate change, just in terms of numbers of tons of gas that we need to pull back down from the atmosphere and stop going to the atmosphere. Terrific, thank you. In other words, we need to see the, the forest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Bruno, you're from Brazil. Um, which of course is uh, so famous for the, the forest there. Um, how, talk to me about the forest and, and, and uh, again, is it too late? What's to be done? Um, are we just rushing over this precipice without, without thought? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, the, the Amazon fires were of course in the headlines uh, last year. Uh, this year they have worsened. Um, even more dramatically in the wetlands to the south of the Amazon, which are also a key ecosystem. They've gone up by perhaps 300%, uh, uh, depending on, you know, uh, maybe 20% of, the, of those lands have, have burnt uh, this year alone. Uh, the Amazon in the last year, the, the Amazon's on track to lose an area the size of the state of Connecticut in, in one year. Um, 
unlike California and, and unlike Australia, for example, in, in the rainforest, uh, uh, the forest, is, it's not natural for the forest to burn, right? So it takes very concerted uh, human effort. It takes money, it takes capital, it takes bulldozers and chainsaws to cut the trees down first uh, uh, before you can um, burn them. Uh, and it takes, in Brazil's case, uh, uh, breaking the law. So the situation really is uh, quite, quite uh, 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 dire. Uh, the big picture uh, uh, and the answer to the question of, of uh, is it too late and, and you know, uh, uh, is that we, we are approaching uh, uh, a tipping point of savanization, right? So savanization uh, 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 is already occurring in some areas. After a certain tipping point, around 20, 25%, it becomes an irreversible uh, process. So the, the consequences of this would be disastrous for uh, uh, precipitation patterns, uh, 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 which would then impact uh, uh, food supply systems and water supply systems and so on. Of course, the most tragic consequences would be to the region itself, to its biodiversity, to its uh, 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 populations, especially uh, indigenous uh, uh, populations. Um, you know, the, the Good news is that, and of course, uh, to go back to Laurie's comments, this is exacerbated by climate change, drier, drier forests burn more easily, but it also exacerbates climate change, right? These feedback loop systems, because as Laurie mentioned, these are major carbon uh, sinks. Um, um, so we don't even quite understand, we understand how bad certain things can get, but you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, unknown uh, unknowns there. But you know, the, the, the good news is that we know the recipe to curb deforestation. Um, in, in, in May, I wrote, I wrote a piece on this in, in the New York Times. If folks want to search it up, search for it. It's, they titled it, The Amazon Will Soon Burn Again, which, which unfortunately has turned out to be uh, uh, correct. And uh, indigenous territories are very effective um, uh, in enforcing the law. Now, there are 30 million people living in the Amazon, and most of these folks live in urban conditions and you know, need to earn livelihoods. So the other conversation we need to have is about bioeconomies and uh, uh, you know, economic models that keep the forests standing and the rivers flowing. And we have plenty of evidence that uh, those are in fact more profitable than what we are currently doing, which is essentially raising the forest, uh, either for land poaching and speculation or for very low productivity uh, cattle ranching. Um, thank you, Bruno. Um, uh, Carl, Bruno touched on, on, on food and nutrition here and the, the relation uh, to this. And I know that uh, uh, in your time in the, in the Horn of Africa and, and elsewhere, uh, you look closely um, at this. Um, what, what, uh, you know, talk to me about how uh, what's going on in terms of climate disruption is, is frankly sort of setting the table for the end result uh, for people who have less money, the, the whole interaction between poverty and, uh, and climate disruption and, uh, and the deep trouble that we're in. Um. Yeah, well, it's a pretty awful situation um, for everyone. And kind of, unfortunately, like all bad things, uh, the poorest people in the world um, are often the worst hit, right? They have the least capacity uh, to respond. Uh, many times they're actually even closer to exposures in terms of climate hazards. Um, when it comes to food markets and thinking about food and how crops are affected by yields, um, it's a lot of it does come down to a price point. And when there are supply issues, price goes up, right? This is simple economics. Um, and it's the people who are already kind of on the line, barely making it. Um, and then all the people below that line who really aren't getting sufficient nutrition, um, they're the ones who are going to suffer the most, but they're also the ones that we tend to hear the least about. Um, I just wanted to make one quick note, actually, to connect all of that, um, but also to tie it back to what Lori and Bruno were talking about in terms of fires. Um, it'd be pretty 
uh, epic to not talk about the Australian bushfires um, when I was here for the 2019-2020 season. Um, Laura was talking about three to five million acres, um, 50 million burnt uh, with our fires, which was pretty insane. Um, I remember waking up one morning and there was, it was orange in Melbourne, which I thought was many kilometers, many, many kilometers away from like the epicenter of the fires. And then it turns out that smoke, that ash, that went all the way over to Argentina from Australia, which is really, I mean, if you want a global picture um, of how, how our world is so connected um, and how climate is so connected in our lives, um, that's it for you. Um, and a lot of the problems with these bushfires was that there was poor mismanagement um, and there was a lot of neglect of early warning system. There was a really bad drought um, in Eastern Australia that had really, really kind of set the tone for it. Um, but I just think it's kind of ironic given that Aboriginal Australians um, have been dealing with this landscape for way longer than anyone else, basically. Um, and they've got their own fire management um, practices and many are, are cultural and people are even tying health benefits from uh, what they call caring for land. Um, and when you're talking about, is it too late? I love thinking about some of these populations that while very vulnerable to climate change, have also outlasted everyone else. You know, the Aboriginal Australians have been here for a really long time. Um, and I think listening to them too could actually provide some of those solutions. Um, and they definitely say that it's not too late. Oh, thank you. Um, Sam Myers, um, let, let's turn to you now. Um, uh, talk to us um, about the scale of how we're dismantling nature and and uh, how that is urgently now tied to our global health. I mean, Kara uh, didn't mention that the fires took the lives of what a billion animals or something was the estimate. Um, such such an assault on biological diversity and life itself on 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 the planet. Um, but but talk to me about this the scale of this. Um, and, and how your approach really addresses this in a way to answer these questions. Is it too late and uh, what are the solutions? Yeah, well, um, President Bacow started out by talking about, I think, the uniqueness of this particular moment um, that we're in. And I, I, I don't think that you can overstate um, how important this moment really is and how unique I think it is in human history and, and the urgency associated with it. So it, it is, it's always tempting when asked, is it too late to very quickly move to, no, it's not too late here, are all these things we can do. I think, I think you need to start by acknowledging the urgency of the moment and um, the scale of the challenges that we face. There's no question that our house is on fire, not just um, literally, but also figuratively, and that biological systems are starting to crumble around us. And I don't think that it's too late to address them, but I do think it's important to understand something about this moment. And as I said earlier, it's not just climate change, it's everything change. And so I think all of our audience, all of you listening probably understand that you know, human activity is affecting environmental systems and that there are things like deforestation and pollution and climate change. But I think what very few of us understand is the extraordinary scale and pace of our impacts across our natural system. So 50 years or so ago in you know, 1960, say, the impact of human activity across natural systems was actually pretty modest. And it's only been in the last several decades that the combination of you know, human population growth and even steeper rises in sort of per capita uh, consumption have led to this almost sort of vertical increase in total world GDP. So there's just been this massive ballooning in humanity's sort of total ecological footprint and what we're asking our planet to provide for us. And the result is that 
you know, we are now outstripping our planet's capacity to either absorb our waste or provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And so our activities are transforming not just the climate system, but biodiversity. We're driving the sixth mass extinction of life on Earth. You know, big changes in land use, land cover, global pollution of air, water, and soil, scarcity of resources like fresh water and arable land, changes to biogeochemical cycles. So all these big, large-scale planetary systems that are changing and they're interacting with each other in ways that we're just starting to understand to affect the sort of core conditions for human health and well-being. And so there's no question that the trajectory that we're on and our, our vast sort of transformation of nature um, is absolutely problematic and that we can't continue on that trajectory. I think you start by acknowledging that and then there's really exciting terrain to move into, which is, you know, is it too late? No, it's not too late. There's a huge amount that we can do. It's too late for some species. It's too late. You know, we've already pushed two thirds of, you know, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes off the face of the planet through our activities just in the last 70 years. So it's too late for some of them, but it's not too late to get on a different course and to chart a course toward a really positive aspirational future. And what that's going to take is essentially changing the way we do everything. It's not just a question of energy systems. It's what our food systems look like. It's what our chemical industry looks like. It's what, you know, how we manufacture our goods, how we design our cities as Bruto was talking about. And the really exciting news, you know, when you actually start to look into each of those domains is A, that we actually have a ton of solutions. So there's a lot that we know how to do and things are moving very, very quickly in all of those domains. And B, there are enormous co-benefits associated with many of the things that we need to do. So Bruno was talking about economic co-benefits with managing you know, the Brazilian Amazon in different ways. There are huge health benefits in terms of transitioning our energy choices and changing the way we get around cities and changing the way we design our built environments and changing our food systems and what we eat. Um, so there, there are large benefits to doing this and they're gonna be critical to getting us on the right path. And I guess the last thing I would say is beyond all of these sort of domain specific sort of technical you know, needs for innovation and solutions, I actually think that there's a need for a sort of cultural and spiritual um, transformation. I think that there's a sort of spiritual crisis underneath all of these challenges that I'm talking about and that we've lost a, um, a sense of connection to the natural world and that um, we need to sort of reinvigorate old stories about our place in the world and our connection to nature um, so that we reinvest our relationship to nature and, and the reverence and awe that we often experience toward nature with the agency to guide our decisions so that it's no longer an ethical thing to do to treat our oceans and our atmosphere like gigantic garbage dumps and, and, and on and on and on. So. Um, across the board, there's room for improvement, but there's a lot that we know how to do. So, Sam, just to quickly follow up on that chart that you uh, uh, that you uh, in inferred, that matches the economic numbers around the world. That if you were to talk to the economists um, and look at uh, at quote GDP uh, growth, close quotes, it's been really rather dramatic. It's it's been exponential. Um, what do you see as a, what's the relationship between um, our economic system and what could be done to have it be more attuned to, uh, well, stopping this dismantling of nature? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, in our book, we actually have that chart of both population growth and per capita GDP and then world GDP. And it's a really, really striking chart because it's so extraordinarily vertical in terms of how the GDP has grown just in the last few decades. Um, and we talk in a, in a whole chapter about economics about exactly that question. So, um, you know, GDP is good at, at, at measuring, you know, production of goods and services. It's terrible at measuring um, happiness in uh, society. It's terrible at measuring equity and how we treat each other. Um, and there's a huge movement in economics to come up with better metrics that um, 
are measuring more what we care about as um, as societies. You know, what we really care about is uh, what makes us happy. So there's a great example um, in the book about um, a family buying a baby stroller. And if you buy a really crummy baby stroller that's going to fall apart in a couple of years, and you use it until you know your baby's a toddler, and then you send it to the garbage dump. Um, that's actually fantastic from the perspective of GDP. If you buy a beautifully constructed baby stroller and then you give it to your brother and he uses it and he gives it to a friend and they give it to their neighbor and it sort of makes its way around the neighborhood and in that process creates all of this kind of social connectedness because all our kids have been pushed around in this same beautifully constructed baby stroller and it brings us all together and you're not wasting any extra, extra materials and it's being recycled over and over and giving lots of people pleasure. Well, that's an absolute disaster from the standpoint of GDP because nobody's buying anything. And so it's a good example of the fact that we're using the wrong metrics when we're thinking about what we want to track as a society. And so there are other metrics that are tracking happiness, that are tracking equity. Um, and there's probably a need for us to start to expand the way we track our progress as societies using different economic metrics. Yeah, so Lori, Lori Weyburn, um, yeah, what about the money and, uh, and the forestry crisis? You know, there's a third curve that has done that same exact hockey curve stick, hockey stick curve, and that's CO2 emissions. So um, these are all interrelated. Um, you know, there have been studies that show that people who live near forests are happier. <laughs> They're healthier. Uh, when you can see forests, you do better on your SAT scores. Uh, but there's a dislocation between who earns money from what in how we manage forests. And forests, unfortunately, even though they are cyclical systems, you know, you cut them, they regrow. Trees regrow. Forests take time forests are complex. When you cut them, the money tends to go out of the community in which those forests grow, and they go to the company that owns the forest. Um, and one of the really critical things, I think, that is a foundation for a solution is reestablishing a more cyclical economy around forests. Number one, it's to pay for forests, not for trees. So that means paying for the water services of forests, for the climate services of forests, for the spiritual and biodiversity services of forests. We pay for their loss through things like fires and floods, but we don't pay to keep them. So we need to reverse that time scale. And we need to be paying communities to become re-engaged in their forests directly. And those communities that benefit way far away because forests clean our air. They provide our water. Whether you're in New York or whether you're in California, your water comes from far, far away. And we need to re relearn, as, as Kara was pointing out, when you live next to your watershed, you know how to take care of your watershed. You know you need to do that. But when you live far away from your watershed and you think your watershed is a faucet, you've forgotten how to take care of your watershed. So this is part of re-engaging distant communities and knitting them back together. From a, from a financial point of view, if you can diversify the sources of money that come to landowners to not just be the fiber or timber, but to also be the carbon sequestration and the broader climate services, because climate and carbon are not the same thing, and water. And these are things that are being done already, certainly throughout the United States and Costa Rica and some other countries as well, where you can pay a small fee on your water bill, reinvest that in conserving your watershed. We can provide subsidies into changing how we manage forests to be forests rather than just fiber plantations. Paying for the time that it takes to really regrow a complex system that we have simplified. Uh, we can see that that is happening at a small level. When I say small, it's a few billion dollars. That's small in the scale of what we need to do for climate change, but in the forest carbon market, driven by the compliance system in California. That is a multi-billion dollar business at this point. So to tie the economies back, we need to make it as profitable to manage for climate 
as it was profitable to manage in ways that drove the degradation of our climate. So our climate economy needs to follow that same uh, hockey stick J curve that our fossil fuel economy, population, and CO2 emissions has done. Uh, Bruno, let, let's continue just for a moment on the money and of course your work on urbanization and uh, the way to make this sustainable as part of a uh, as part of the solution of what's of what's to be done. Uh, share your views about how we should reshape uh, the cities and the economic structure and the physical structure of them uh, to respond to the emergency. Yeah. Um, wait. There's... You're on. I oh, can I hear am you. on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now there's yeah there's a lot on the table now so so i'll try to to, to answer your question and, and try to, to connect it uh you, uh, it, 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 you, other... can, you, you can ignore my question and simply respond no, to what you've no, heard it, that's it's, it's a very important question <laughs> you know there, there's a growing uh consensus among uh, uh uh people working on urbanization that compact metropolitan areas with uh, uh pedestrian friendly neighborhoods with uh, uh, uh public parks uh, and accessible mass transit are generally much more uh, ecologically sustainable uh, uh, and much uh, healthier, have much better health indicators than car-reliant uh, sprawling areas. So, so here too, again, we know the recipe. The problem is that a lot of the incentives push us in uh, uh, the opposing direction. So to, to this, this echoes something Sam mentioned, uh, uh, but to give a little more precise contours, urban contours to it. I mean, in, you know, a, a lot of the things that we can do to, to slow down our march of folly towards climate disaster uh, are the same things we can do to tackle racial inequities, uh, uh, inequalities, and uh, uh, injustices, right? Again, mm -hmm. mass transit correlates with better socioeconomic mobility and so on and so forth, and, and I, I could go on uh, for quite some time. I think uh, Laurie pointed to something crucial in the, the study of the urban now, which is sort of a mismatch of scales, the scales of an actual city, if we think of it, not just as a municipality, but in terms of its energy systems, where its refuse ends up, and so on and so forth, because from that perspective, New York City doesn't end in its boundaries. You have to consider where its water comes from, where its pollution uh, uh, ends up, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and our structures of governance, uh, uh, um, this works for transit systems too, right? But uh, and our structures of governance are, are from a, a, a period when our s urban areas didn't have a footprint comparable to, to what they are now. Um, let, me, let me connect leaving the city for a moment now to something that I think is very important, Caro mentioned, and is, 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 is a very uh, uh, recurrent point in these discussions in, in the, the global south, uh, and especially in Brazil, where, where a lot of my work uh, uh, is connected to. It's this idea of learning from societies that have gone through uh, environmental collapse before, right? A lot of indigenous uh, communities throughout the globe have gone through, through an experience that for a lot of us will be new. Uh, and is new for a lot of folks in, in, in California and so on that are feeling climate change, you know, in, and are seeing it and are feeling it in, in, in the burning fires and in uh, uh, the dislocations and so on. Uh, I think there's, there's a lesson here. This is something we haven't touched on uh, that connects to a lot of work that I've done on how authoritarians uh, uh, use social media uh, uh, to bolster their appeal. Uh, the climate change angle of this is that I think we often assume that once people really feel and see climate change's impacts, they'll become aware and they'll act on it. And there's, you know, some evidence that it could go in the, uh, 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 it could have the opposite effect, right? And, and, I, and I say this because I think it connects to Sam's crucial point about spiritual uh, uh, dimensions or whatever you might call it. Um, you know, in an often scary and confusing world, I think we tend to underestimate the appeal of realities not grounded in the material world, right? And that can mean many things. It can mean positive things, uh, uh, like a spiritual connection, you know, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But I think we need to open up the modes through which we speak of our place in the planet that in ways that are not just scientific and defined by science. 
uh, but I also think we need to understand how a lot of how it's very hard to face the harrowing truths that we've been speaking about, right? The, the, the folks, it's, it's very inspiring to hear of the work that you all do. It's, it's very difficult. It's much easier to respond to climate change by finding comfort in, you know, uh, 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 fantasies that, that say it's a hoax or that it's not really happening or that things will be fine because some silver bullet will come from Silicon Valley or, 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 or whatever. You know, so I mean this because I, I think this is a conversation we need to have by way of, of, of recognizing wh where we are and what our challenges uh, 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 and the challenges uh, 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 ahead, right? I think- uh, uh, Bruno, uh, excuse me. Yeah. How, how toxic do you think social media is uh, to, uh, for dealing with this crisis? How toxic do you think it is? Well, you know, a, a lot of folks asked in their questions, you know, uh, 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 things to do, and we'll get to that conversation. Uh, and I think conversations about uh, uh, big tech and, and their role in uh, 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 essentially stimulating disinformation campaigns has been major. In, in Brazil's case, uh, which certainly echoes in the US, you know, if you poll people, very few people want to burn down the Amazon. Uh, and yet, a lot of people are voting for governments that have that as their ideological commitment. Uh, and part of that is because they are being bombarded on WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups with uh, 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 stories about how either the fires aren't really happening or it's international NGOs are setting it on fire because, you know, uh, uh, this is a way through which the uh, international community is going to take this away from us, or it's, you know, uh, uh, communists are setting it on fire to weaken the government or, 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 or whatever it might be, right? Um, and I understand the appeal of those sorts of narratives, right? It's, it's easier to sit there and be like, yeah, all those bad people are pretending the Amazon's burning, but it's not really burning, you know? Uh, all these, you know, Harvard professors in the Soros payroll are making money off of, you know, uh, uh, telling us about climate change, but this thing's a hoax. That's a much easier position to be in than the position that, you know, folks uh, 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 in the front lines are, are in, right? Yeah. So, 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 Caro, um, this is probably unfair, but you're you're in that, from that demographic that has uh, been living with social media for a long time. Um, What's to be done? How, how, how do we deal with this disinformation? I just want to say on my part, I heard the other day that Russian television has a, has a Spanish language channel on direct TV, which is, you know, the low income crowd can afford direct TV compared to other cable services. And they are pumping out, especially in South Florida, uh, what I think many would consider outright lies about the democratic candidates. And, uh, and because it's in the box of, a cable television channel that I never watched, that I never heard of, and not involved with this is all happening, uh, and obviously expanded on social media. So you've been watching this. Do you, what suggestions, if any, do you have as to how, how to deal with this? Um, I guess a suggestion. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that social media can be insidious in so many ways. Um, that's not to you know, detract from all the ways that it is great um, and the ways that it does when used with the truth can be really powerful. Um, I think a clear cut solution is some kind of regulation. Um, social media seems to have fallen into one of these very special categories where it's advancing, the algorithms are getting better and better, quicker than our loss can keep up. Um, and I know that when people don't want to believe something, they don't need social media telling them over and over again um, to reinforce that. But like they'll do it anyways, right? There are people who will be climate skeptics no matter what. Um, but the problem of social media, of these um, conspiracy groups um, or just, just fake news, um, what they do is they, they definitely push, I think a larger demographic, um, a larger, density of people to to start questioning things that um really at this point we shouldn't be questioning right like it's not too late but we are committed we have committed climate change like we need to act now um and the fact that social media is one of 
the, I think a, a really big weapon against us acting um, when it should be just a weapon for us acting. Uh, it's pretty frustrating and I think the U.S. could show a little bit more leadership maybe in their uh, tech regulation there. So this is a wild, wild west where essentially truth is getting shot every day. Feels like that. Yeah. Hey, so we have a lot of questions uh, about what the impact of personal and consumer choices uh, might have uh, in these situations and, uh, and what actions that individuals uh, might be able to take. So, so uh, Carol, perhaps you could start, start with your perspective on that. What are some things that each of us can do? Now, Sam called out for us to have a new spiritual connection and that we need, we are single species. We share the language of DNA with everything living on this planet from, you know, the wood of a tree to the, to the cur wood here, right? It's the same thing. Um, but we, uh, so there's a lot to be done collectively, but what can individuals do? What can somebody listening to us right now perhaps go out, aside from writing a check to, let's see, Harvard, then Pacific Trust, <laughs> and, um, what, can, what, could, uh, what, what can be done? Uh, what can individuals do? Yeah, um, actually, it's a great question to ask me because I feel like I'm one of those uh, young people who, I don't feel like I have that much influence on the world. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, but that there's so much to be done that that shouldn't be uh, something to stop you. And um, I know personally what I've been trying to do, and of course it never feels like enough, um, but it's just educating myself, keeping updated on all this and having conversations. Um, I have some family out in South Dakota um, and I know what it's like to have hard conversations. Um, but I think that's a really big step um, I think obviously voting uh, is a huge thing. I don't need to preach to the choir here, um, but helping out with uh, where your vote goes, right? And helping out with the campaigns, I think can be huge. I've done my fair share of door knocking um, and getting doors slammed in my face. Um, and the last thing I want to put a little, uh, a little, uh, I guess, ad for, not, I mean, do it within the boundaries of the law, but I think dumpster diving um, and it kind of going at the war on food waste. I think that is huge. Um, we haven't talked about the climate implications of food waste. Um, so but we haven't talked about most things <laughs> uh, related to climate change. Say something about food waste uh, briefly, because I think it's an important... Um, yeah, basically around a third of the food that we produce uh, gets wasted. And that's insane when you think there's 800 million people hungry um, and growing. And I know the food that you waste isn't actually gonna feed someone who needs it, but it's, we're talking about systems here, like Sam brought up. These are, these are we're all part of this system. Um, and partly because of uh, the adrenaline rush, but also mostly for morals. Um, I think dumpster diving, uh, if you are, you know, privileged enough to be fit and you're um, okay with having some weird stuff in your body, but you know, you have the resources <laughs> to get that sorted out. Um, I think to everyone taking individual ways in their own capacity um, makes a difference whether or not it feels like it or not. Yeah. And you know, in Europe, instead of exactly dumpster diving they have the system in some countries where at the end of the sales day the grocery stores the food stores will drastically cut prices for people to come in and get the stuff that would otherwise get put in the dumpster behind the store um so we don't have a whole lot of time left but uh, Lori, let me let me turn to you and ask uh, again what what are some some of those personal consumer type choices individuals uh can make and i don't know you may have an, a real world example of of initiatives along those lines that are working either little or big? Well, people make all the difference. Margaret Mead was absolutely right uh, with that. Number one, you can choose what you buy. You can buy organic food. You can buy holistic range beef. Regenerative agriculture is a hugely important factor in restoring 
the fertility of this earth. You can push your community and institutions like Harvard to say, I'm only gonna give contracts to groups that, for example, build with 20% or 50% or an increasing amount of their wood that comes from conserved, well-managed forests. We can drive our communities and our governments to say, we're gonna do what we did with recycling or what we do with renewable energy. And we're going to have a climate standard that every state needs to live up to or every community needs to live up to. As an individual and everybody listening to this program is intelligent, capable, and I suspect passionate, not only in your own life, but for your children and grandchildren. So get involved in driving these transformations. Harvard can be a leader here. President Bacow talked about being bold. Harvard should step up. Make sure this is core to its curriculum. Make sure this is core to how the endowment is invested. Being at zero is insufficient. No forest is ever at carbon zero. It's well below that. So Harvard, every new building that Harvard builds, get that wood from a conserved, well-managed forest. Have all your food systems be tied to regenerative agriculture. And take the time to learn where things come from and get involved in the communities where those things come from. If you're in New York, understand how the Adirondacks are managed. If you're in New England, go whether you're in the US or whether you're somewhere else and have your recipient community be involved in supporting the communities from where your food and water and clean air come from. So purchasing, absolutely as an individual, getting involved in driving new policies that can change systems, because each of us as individuals are a little bit like the butterfly wing on the iron ball. But if we drive the change in the systems that drive the economies, so that we realign our economic and our ecologic system, so we put the eco back in economy, we will make a huge difference. And I do want to echo Caro, we all know it, but do it, vote. <laughs> so we're really right up against the clock here. Um, so I'm going to turn to you, Bruno, but you just take a minute, please, so that Sam can have the last word again uh, on, on that scale here. All right. So right, and, and the question is, hey, so what can people do, uh, especially yeah. on an individual level? I'll, I'll try to talk quickly. Uh, first, I second every, uh, uh, I, I guess mostly everything uh, uh, Caro and, and, and Laurie said, certainly yeah, the majority of it vote. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I learned about uh, uh, the threats of deforestation through the news, support journalism, local journalism, especially in the clickbait social media era, uh, support research, educational institutions, pressure, big tech, uh, 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 um, uh, and financial institutions to divest from uh, worst uh, offenders, uh, big tech, uh, per the conversation we had earlier. I think if you live in the US, zoning reform is absolutely uh, urgent. The single family detached home, car dependent lifestyle is has a massive footprint. It's enormously destructive. Uh, uh, and, it, and it's not the choice of a lot of Americans that can't afford to live uh, in cities. Part of this has to do with uh, 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 certain nimbyism that makes it very difficult to build compact cities around mass transit, uh, uh, for example. Uh, I want to touch up on one note on a, on a cautionary tale because a lot of folks wrote in about uh, uh, population management and overpopulation, which is of course uh, uh, an issue uh, we, we ought to talk about in connection to climate change. The notes I'll, I'll, I'll add to that is how, of course, when we run the numbers uh, per capita, uh, and this is just uh, relying on very few variables and not considering things like land use change, the per capita of somebody living in a sprawling US suburb is uh, at least three times, if not much more than uh, of a comparable person in an European country with similar quality of life, and uh, uh, um, several dozen times those of folks in many other countries in the world, uh, uh, in, 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 in Africa or Latin America or uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd caution against uh, uh, overpopulation and population control as, as, as something we focus on before we talk about uh, per capita terms. And yeah. as somebody who studies cities, 
I'd be much more concerned with folks that already moved to cities in countries like India uh, uh, or, uh, 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 well, basically anywhere else, adopting the US Australian urbanization models. There we get proportionally much more significant increases in footprint than we do when folks move from the countryside and to cities and have access to the types of uh, 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 goods and quality of life that many of us take for granted in uh, uh, the United States. Excellent point, Bruno. I had someone mention to me at one point in this discussion that um, the typical American, and I'm sorry, I forget which year this is, consumes 13 times what a typical Brazilian would consume. Mm -hmm. So as America goes up in population about 100 million people over this next 40 or 50 years, it's the same as adding 1.3 billion Brazilians to the planet. Mm -hmm. So consumption is, is, is huge. Sam, the floor is yours. Um, we're a little over time here. I think our, um, our, our keepers will allow us a couple of minutes to wrap up, but probably not much more than that. So. Um, Take it away however you want, although people do want to hear what they could do on a personal level. Well, so I guess I'd say three, three sort of categories. We've talked a lot about the first, which is your own sort of personal choices. And you can do an audit about what you eat and how you move around and even how many kids you have and where you live um, and think about the impacts of those decisions. The second area we've talked less about and I think is really relevant to this community of, of Harvard grads, which is um, innovation and actually coming up with new solutions. And so, you know, that system that Steve talked about in Europe to connect consumers with grocers at the end of the day comes from an app that somebody developed for a smartphone called Too Good To Go. And it's being used by millions of Europeans uh, to get food that otherwise would have been wasted. And that helps the consumers because it's cheap, healthy food. It helps the grocers because they make a profit on what they would have thrown out. And it really helps the environment because all those resources weren't wasted. And so there's a huge sort of domain of you know, whether it's indigo ag coming up with climate sensitive agriculture or beyond meat, you know, and producing new products. So there's a huge, huge realm of innovation that could make a big difference. And then the third area is to say, you know what, as individuals, there's only so much that you can do. And if you're not coming up with some massive new innovation, your individual actions are only so relevant. They're important. But what, re what really matters is collective action. And almost all the problems that we're talking about are what Marshall Gans would have called power problems, not knowledge problems. It's not that we don't understand them or know enough about what to do about them. It's often that we have exploitative industries that have managed to achieve legislative capture and are protecting their own interests and their own profits. And the way you address power problems is through collective action. So you need to come together as a community and push on industries and governments, just like so many Harvard alums are pushing on Harvard right now around divestment. And you know that kind of collective action um, is really, really important. And so it's also, I would add, really good for the kind of depression and anxiety and isolation associated with that feeling of being the butterfly on the steel ball that can't possibly move the needle. So when you come together in collective action and you find your partners, then you can actually make a difference. So um, we'd certainly welcome anybody to check out the Planetary Health Alliance. Um, uh, and there are many other organizations like that where you can find your partner and, um, and come together in collective action. And if uh, folks look to the, uh, the chat page or our hyperlinks to uh, the activities of all the folks you heard, I'll just say uh, in closing, um, as Sam points out, there is a power problem. And in future sessions, um, I, I hope that this forum explores the role of systemic racism in all of this. Uh, it's important in the international climate negotiations, the, the balance of economic power uh, between the affluent North and the less affluent South uh, is driving a lot of these uh, problems that are we're seeing in the symptom of, of, of climate disruption. Um, and as the President Backow said at the beginning, systemic racism is very much a part of this. Um, but I, for the moment, I want to I want to thank you all, uh, Lori and Sam and Bruno and Caro, uh, for taking a time out of your busy schedules uh, uh, to speak to the alums. And uh, 
I also want to thank the co-sponsors, uh, members of the Harvard class of 1969. Yes, we carried Dean Epps out of University Hall, and we have been making trouble ever since, and good trouble, as I think John Lewis would call it. Um, the Harvard Alumni for uh, Climate and the Environment, the Harvard Club of New Hampshire, um, and the Harvard Office for Sustainability. Um, again, thanks all of you for attending, and um, see you all on this next time.